I have been a theater director and a theater teacher of acting and directing for over 45 years. My burning question has always been, what makes human beings behave the way they do? And the complications of the attempt to communicate. As a planet and society in crisis, we need clear, honest communication. Effective and affective communication is a nourishing relationship between you, your research, and your audience. Dynamic precision and spontaneity are required. Communicating is perhaps the most challenging of all human skills. It is a science and an art form requiring precise language of your research expertise, along with artful use of example, analogy, metaphor, and story to deepen understanding and meaning in the minds, hearts, and nervous systems of your listeners. Communication is nourishment for your listener and helps them thrive in this chaotic world. Here is a slide of the beginnings of life, floating in the womb of nourishment and connected to the mother through the umbilical cord. If communication is nourishment, then when we communicate to listeners, I think it is important to think about the way we are connected almost like an umbilical cord to our audience. We are here when we communicate to reach out with nourishment and sustenance to our audiences. Communicating research from a place of expertise, authentic listening and answering, and dare I say empathy, will often make a lasting impression on the listener and perhaps move the world forward. I hear often from UC San Diego, this beautiful quote that one of the missions of the university is the future of innovation with an emphasis on empathy. What does that really mean? What does it mean to communicate with empathy? Communicating is a dynamic relationship between you, your research and your audience. It begins with you. It begins with you as the mother load. And from you, you spill your authenticity. It is important to be direct, especially when you're inside this box like I am right now. How do we communicate inside this box when we are looking at other boxes and perhaps many other things on our screen. How do we make that umbilical cord happen in the womb of this new kind of communication? It is so important because we are not able to connect person to person. So we need to really reach through the screen to make a lasting impression on the listener. Show us you as you guide us into the world of your research and why it matters to you, to us and to the world. Tell us what you know and show us how you feel. Help us to know the burning question that drives your research and perhaps the personal story of the Sparker origin of how you began your work and with a specific focus on solutions as we have heard today. So there is you, there is your research, and then there is the listener, the other. We must make a connection to their minds, to their hearts, and to their nervous systems by illuminating information which can relieve and sustain us. Active and deep listening, what that means is you're listening, maybe to the collective fear, to the collective need, not only in the moment,
but in the way the world is right now. It is important to acknowledge the fear and pain of your listeners, to find and express common ground between you and them. All human beings have shared needs like safety, sustenance, love and belonging, self-actualization. Protect us, help us to know the truth of the problem and a path to fix it. This is your research. The most clicked on word on the internet is the word you. And the reason for that is because with all of the information that's being thrown at us all of the time, when we hear the word you, it's like, wait, is this about me? That's the umbilical cord connection. So perhaps instead of saying the public, maybe we say you. Maybe we say me and us. Maybe we personalize our communication just that way. The other thing I really want to talk about is the fact that your audience, your listeners, have different ways of receiving information. I think of this as diversity of thought and reception. As communicators, we need to reach out to different kinds of imaginations, to different kinds of brains in order to leave indelible lasting images. People receive and are imprinted by information differently. So an example is in Shakespeare, Shakespeare had two different kinds of audiences. One were the royalty, the upper class, who wanted to hear heightened language because that was their entertainment. And then there were the groundlings the poor people who wanted to hear things direct. So there was heightened language and there was direct language. So an example is Juliet speaking to Romeo on the balcony. She's very practical. So because Romeo suddenly leaps onto the balcony, poetry comes out of her mouth, perhaps for the first time. And she says, my bounty is as boundless as the sea. The more I give, the more I have, for both are infinite. And then two lines later, she says, do you love me? So you see, we have heightened and we have direct. We have the idea that the more we give, the more we receive. That is active listening. That is deep communication. It is very difficult. It is very difficult, particularly when you are speaking to people who are opposing you. How do you find something in common? This diversity of thought means that some people receive information through images, through metaphor or analogy, through heightened connection. So when I was a little girl, I used to go to the roof of my house when there was a full moon. And I would stare longingly into what I thought was a portal into another world. So what I thought the moon was, was it was cut out of the sky. And there was a whole white world full of the answers to the mysteries of the universe that I could, if I could somehow get in there, into that portal of light. That's what my imagination was doing when I thought about the moon. Then a couple of years went by and I watched on my black and white TV set, astronauts landing on the moon. Perhaps one of the greatest scientific moments in history. I, however, was devastated because the moon is a rock. I was very disoriented for a while. Then my father was smart enough to bring me to the library and give, get, give me all kinds of books on the moon. And I studied it, I researched it. I researched as many facts as I could about the moon. And if you were to ask me today, what is the moon? 
I would say it's both. It is both the facts of the moon and it is the poetry of the moon because the poetry is connected to our deepest longings, to the future of innovation, to the, to the fertile void spaces that contain leaps of innovation. So as an artist, I received the moon in one way and perhaps a scientist receives it in another. My hope for the future is that we merge, we merge the art and science of communication and of dreaming of ways that we can change the world. So here's a picture of an astronaut. He's got an umbilical cord connected to the mother load. The definition of mother load is a treasure of great value and abundance. That is you, you as researchers. You are the mother load. Have the courage. You know, in Latin, the word core means both courage and heart. So what I hope for the future of communication in a broken and ruptured world, perhaps getting ready to become a new world, what I hope for is that you communicate through the abundance of your expertise and from the abundance of your heart. Thank you.